Hi, everybody. Tonight, we're going to continue the series on the Bible. And I'm going to, as I said before, I'm not going to, you know, get every story. <laughs> There's way too many. But I'm just going to highlight certain stories that I think are very well known and also have a great deal of meaning for us. So the, the next story, uh, you know, last time I did the Garden of, e of Eden and then I did uh, Cain and Abel. Tonight we're going to start with the flood. Now the flood is one of those things, man, you could riff on that for a long time. And it's really cool how at one time this idea of the flood was really seen as purely legend and there wasn't anything historically true to it. Now we're not quite so sure about that. And there seems to be a kind of a universal flood myth that you find through all over, throughout all over the world. And there's actually some, seems to be some geographical evidence that there, there was some great periods of deluge and that these experiences of civilizations being wiped out and then, you know, a remnant sort of, you know, recovering probably were pretty real. And so it was, it was then how they interpreted what happened that really mattered. And a lot of people interpret the flood, you know, is like I said, you know, this view that God, you know, changes his mind and, you know, he got pissed off at what the humans were doing. So, you know, he wipes the slate clean again and just keeps Noah and his family. But the other way, uh, the way I'm kind of going at it is maybe God doesn't change. Uh, maybe the reality is that we change. And so throughout human history, uh, people changed and understood and kind of grew in consciousness and their understanding and just like hopefully an individual can do in their own life. So the flood story is interesting because waters have always represented in mythology chaos. You know, even if you go back to the beginning of the very opening of the Genesis chapters, you know, it's out of this chaos that order is brought. And the, the waters always represented that. And you can imagine for humans, especially humans that maybe weren't seafaring, that the ocean was pretty, pretty wild, you know. And even for those that first started to do that, you know, and there's some theories now that there were seafaring early humans that were making their way out of, you know, the Levant and, and the African areas and, and going out. It would be scary, really scary to do. And so I think the ocean always had this kind of mystery to it. Still does. And so there's a power there in telling that kind of story. Water also is a main symbol of being alive, right? We can't survive without water. We can go out food for a while, but we can't survive without water. And we need water to have life. So without it, like in a dry desert, you know, we're out of luck. So water is an incredibly powerful symbol. But what do I... What am I, what's my takeaway? What's, what do I want to share with you as I think is an insight about the flood? For me, I'm going to go back to this sort of chronological thing of us as human beings kind of evolving from little ones into bigger ones. And I look at the whole story of the human race the same way. You know, we all went through these different dispensations or stages just as we do as an individual human. And for me, it represents the chaos of of the younger years of our life. I think somewhere around the age of around nine years of age, we started to try to make a sense of things. We're trying to make order. You know, we go from this period when we're very little, where, you know, if somebody hides, we don't know where they went. I mean, the reason that kids love hide and seek, I always think of hide and seek like exposure therapy. <laughs> where am I? Here I am, you know, and you kind of gently get kids to used to the idea that it, there, there's something that's still there even when they can't see it. That's big. And then as kids get even a little bit older, you know, they start to form memories. You know, it seems that humans don't really form memories the way we think about them ordinarily until they're like three or four. So there's a lot of chaos, right? And so as you get into that age of eight or nine into what we call the third stage of development, you begin to try to make order out of that chaos. And, uh, and you're trying to figure out, especially as you get into adolescence and then you get into puberty. And, you know, as far as nature's concerned, when you hit 12, 13, you're an adult, man. And I know, you know, society tries to inf infantilize everyone. But the fact of the matter is, it's, it's so. I, I, 
I think it's fascinating to me that, you know, uh, when we think about our country and the writing of the Constitution or, or the Declaration of Independence, and they don't realize that these people were very young. Like James Adams was like 18. <laughs> you know, with the people did a whole lot of living, you know, uh, and started very young. So, but I think when we hit that stage around there, we're trying to figure out a vehicle, uh, a boat, if you will, uh, to carry us through those storms of the chaos. So I think the chaos just not only represents us being little and now we're older and kind of looking back on our early story, but now we enter like these really chaotic years, especially going into the teenage period. And we're just, man, we're just trying to figure out who the heck we are. And we're trying to find a vehicle uh, are trying to find a way to conceive of ourselves that allows us to have a, a good ship to carry us through those tumultuous waters. And that's why I think it's really important that we start teaching wisdom to children. And that, you know, the, the, that early period of, you know, pubescence and going into adulthood, that's a prime time, you know. And, and so, that's what I think that this represents. In a larger sense, you could say that, you know, the chaos of the waters, of the flood waters that hit our lives sometimes, you know, everything's going along, we feel kind of cool, everything's good, and then bam, you know, this big wall of water comes along and just knocks everything away. And so I think we all need to, to build a good, a good raft, a good boat, a good ship that can help us carry us through these waters. Interestingly, in the Buddhist tradition, uh, the Buddha looked at whatever spiritual practices help you get to the other shore of enlightenment and awakening. That was your raft. And, and pointedly, he said, you know, when you get there, when you have some sort of realization and understanding, you don't carry the raft with you. So I think that the insight there is, is that whatever raft we're using, whatever vehicle we have, you know, and let's just talk about it as spiritual traditions, faith traditions, that it's there for a purpose to get us through those chaotic floodwaters and to get us safe to the other shore. But it, it never should be something we look at as something permanent, but something rather that's transitory. Like the Buddha said, you know, once you get to the other shore, you don't carry the boat around your back. So I think that it means both those things. So that's the takeaway. Flood chaos. <laughs> and then the boat is our vehicle that we try to form and that we need to build and we need to have to get us through those uh, waters. And at the same time, recognizing that my faith tradition, I'm a Buddhist, right? That's how I'm identifying. I, I, you know, honestly, that's just a label. You know, no one looks at the sky and says, oh, look at the Buddha sky. Or no one looks at the earth and says, oh, look at that Christian earth. You know, it, it, it's la they're labels that we use for convenience. And they also can be things that can help us to temporarily kind of get somewhere. Because you got to have a raft. you got to have a boat. You know, you, you, otherwise you're going to drown, man. So that's, that's the meaning of that story. Now, the next story I want to talk about is the Tower of Babel. You know, so when someone says, oh, you're babbling, yeah, that's where it comes from. It's the idea at one time that, and I'm not going to get into all the other structures of the story, like building this giant tower to try to reach God, you know, and, and showing, you know, the, uh, the hubris of humanity. Again, a lot of these stories seem to have this idea that God is like this, this being that is, you know, it, it's reacting to what humans are doing, like a, like a parent who has no idea what their kids are going to do next and kind of loses their temper and, you know, makes laws for them and then breaks them and you know it's kind of weird for me what I like better is that, that that you know however we want to just talk about God I think I don't think of God that way I think of God is is eternal so for me it's it's about the human kind of evolving in their different levels of consciousness and awareness so for me the Tower of Babel is about humans uh, kind of coming into connect contact with other groups and cultures and that if you blend them all together and you don't have anything that unifies them, then what you get is, again, chaos. And so it's said in the story that God causes their language to be dispersed so they couldn't understand each other. Well, 
it's pretty Machiavellian that if you don't if you don't have you don't speak the same language, it's very easy to overtake a culture. And so the takeaway lesson for me about the Tower of Babel is this: we have to have things that we hold in common, no matter how different we are, no matter what culture we've come from. If we're going to live together peaceably and we're going to continue to grow and evolve and be able to manifest you know, and live out of our, our true selves and, our, and have you know, the best life we can possibly have, we have to have things in common. And we have to focus on the things that are in common. I think way today we focus way too much on why, how we're different. And again, I, don't, I love variety and I don't have any problem with any of that. But the concern I have is culturally, if you don't have a common language, it's chaos and things fall apart. And that's what the Tower of Babel represents. And not only just an ordinary culture, I think spiritually we need a language. For me, the language of oneness is the language that allows everyone, regardless of their faith, tradition, background, regardless of you know, their orientations and spiritual tradition, this language of oneness allows us to sort of find common ground and communicate with each other. And I think that this language of oneness uh, is the antidote to Babel. And it's the thing that not just in religion and spirituality, but I think it's true in our in every culture. Y but you want to you take a culture down, you divide the people by focusing on how they're different and then give them lots of different languages to speak so that no one understands each other anymore. And you're going to have a fine time of it. So we need to find ways to, to be one with each other and we need common languages and we need common uh, ideals and beliefs that we hold up between us. And that's the story. That's the meaning I get from the Tower of Babel. And finally, I want to talk about the story of Abraham. Now, that's a big epic, right? Abraham, who is the great father of, of the Jews. And f for me, Abraham's story has so many different levels to it. Like, there's this really cool play point where he, he meets this guy named Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem this place he comes to and, and he makes an offering to Melchizedek and Melchizedek does a sort of a sacred meal with him. And there's so many interesting parallels between this cosmic figure of Melchizedek uh, and, and in the Buddhist tradition, the Tathagata. You know, the Tathagata is very similar to Melchizedek and sort of representing this, this forerunner. You know, so the Tathagata is like this cosmic uh, mythic creature that is the forerunner of not even creature, maybe unborn, that represents Shakyamuni. In just the same way, the Christians began to see Melchizedek as a prefiguration of Christ. So I think it's really cool. But I'm not going to go into that one. <laughs> That's a fun one, but I'm not going to go into that too far. Other than to say, you know, in every ancient story, origin story of a people's, there always seems to be some prefiguring of wisdom that then is realized later. No, the story for me is the story of Abraham and Isaac. Because I think that that story represents, again, a human change in understanding. So what's the story of Abraham and Isaac? Well, the story goes that God decides he's going to test Abraham, and in order to really test him, uh, he, wants, he tells him he has to sacrifice his son. And so Abraham, being very dutiful and obedient, you know, takes that <laughs> Isaac up and he ties him down and he's going to sacrifice him. So the deity seems very satisfied uh, with his obedience. And so what he does is he sends out, I can't remember, it's a goat or a lamb, and he uses the sacrifice instead. Why is this story important? Well, I think it has two big meanings. One is there was a time where humans realized that sacrificing animals and sacrificing humans was just not cool. <laughs> now, what I'm saying is, is that there was, a, there was a, a sort of evolution in consciousness where they realized that sacrifice, sacrificing life, 
was was not the best way to sort of being in harmony with nature. Now it's very interesting because it's very easy to see where sacrifice came from, human sacrifice and animal sacrifice. And I think one of the big takeaways you can take from this story is this represents, at least in the life of the Jews, this represents where they went from human sacrifice um, to not doing that. And so I think it's a, it represents not just you know Abraham and, and the, the Hebrews. I think it represents that humans go through this period where they just kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know if that's really cool to do. Now, when I went back to the story of Cain and Abel, and I talked about the circle of life, you know, uh, Abel makes a, a sacrifice. He makes an offering of an animal, and I think that I, you know, I went into what I think that signifies. But you can kind of see how humans kind of got the idea that the blood is the life. You know, I always think when you say that, it should sound like Bela Lugosi, the blood is the life. But uh, you know, you can see how humans would believe that in some sense that not only does nature ordinarily bring about this circle of life, which you know involves you know lives being taken, but that that maybe that's the way we remedy things when things are out of harmony. And I think that this story highlights the idea that this is a lower level of conscious awareness. And that when we get to a higher level of conscious awareness, we realize that we can be in harmony in nature without necessarily having to replicate it. And I think that's a, a, a very important insight. Again, I don't want to confuse anyone because I do think that the other story about Cain and Abel is definitely about accepting the, the pain of life. But I think when humans you know, realized that pain, they also started to use that pain as a kind of a bartering tool. And so those who you know, were in power and control began to take the lives of other innocents and offer them up to their, whatever they felt was their way of kind of being in harmony with that deity or being in harmony with the forces of nature. And I think, you know, at some point humans evolve out of that. I'm going to finish with a little story, a sidebar on this, with uh, whenever uh, there's a famous Buddhist teacher who supposedly came from Pakistan, uh, his name was Padmasambhava, and he goes into this place in Nepal called Tibet. Now the Tibetans, before this time, are known as the blue-faced monkey people. They're kind of a very warrior-like folk and they also include uh, human sacrifice and possibly cannibalism. And then Padmasambhava, this great uh, Indian teacher saint, uh, comes in and shares the Dharma. And one of the rituals uh, that he saw happening was this sort of human sacrifice going on in this kind of cannibalistic ritual. So. You know, Padmasambhava not wanting to sort of, you know, realizing like a good parent, uh, if you will, that, you know, you just can't take away the kids' toys. Uh, you can't just sort of turn the lights off. You got to give them a gradual sort of way of getting used to a new thing and a new environment, a new understanding. So what he does is he creates a ritual where they use some barley and flour and they make this, this human figure and instead of sacrificing a human, this now represents all the afflictions and all the things that humans, you know, um, wrestle with that cause them suffering. And, and then they ritualize that, it's called chod. Uh, and then they cut that up and then they even partake of the pieces of that body in like a sort of a Eucharist, if you will. And that's how they did it. So. They went from, you know, being these sort of human sacrificing, you know, cannibalistic sort of culture to this incredibly, you know, peaceful culture. And so this is how they did it. So I think that story is a nice little microcosm. And again, I might got some of the details wrong, but that's, that's a nice little micro, microcosm of the macrocosm of what I think the meaning of the story of Abraham and Isaac is. It's how we move out of that lower level of conscious awareness and we raise it into a higher uh, meaning. So there you go.
So we have the big takeaways are the flood. This is the, we need to build a boat to get us through the waters of chaos and to get us to the other shore. And then, you know, we need to put the boat down when we get there. The story of the Tower of Babel is really that, you know, we, we, we need to have a common endeavors, a common language, and a, and a common way of, of communicating. Otherwise, you know, you just can't build a, a culture on that. Secondly, or lastly, thirdly, uh, the story of Abraham and Isaac, which is about us moving away from some more primitive ideas around how we get into harmony with life to, to more higher levels of consciousness. And I gave the story of Padma Sambhava because I think that's a really brilliant example of how we can do that in our own lives. When we, we find that an idea that we had is kind of rough and it's a lower level of consciousness, when we move into the higher state, we don't want to like be punitive and, and make fun of that lower state. We want to understand it and we want to bring the reality it represents into a higher level of awareness. So there you go. So I hope you enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time.